You're telling me that I've already made up my mind at that point in time. It was all but a certain conclusion. Cause no other time. I am offended because 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 it's not true in terms of what you were given. Jury, before you found somebody expert to say this person's going to give expert and lay testimony. Did you object at that point in time, sir? Cause you already instructed the jury that that witness was going to provide expert and lay Did testimony. Did you object at that point in time? Young Tug trial halted. The transcript of the ex parte meeting that caused the pause in the Young Tug YSL trial in Fulton County has been released. The unredacted transcript was filed by Fulton County Superior Court on Monday night after Judge Ural Glanville decided to halt the case indefinitely. The pause allows another judge to review motions seeking Glanville's disqualification or recusal from the case. The meeting occurred on the morning of June 10, involving state witness Kenneth Lil Woody Copeland. His attorney, prosecutors from the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, and Judge Glanville. The context of this meeting is significant. On June 7, Copeland was held in contempt of court for refusing to testify. He spent the weekend in jail and was brought to the meeting on Monday morning. After the meeting, Copeland testified but his statements were vague and did not meet the state's expectations. During a break in proceedings, Brian Steele, Young Tug's attorney, confronted Judge Glanville about the ex parte meeting. Steele claimed he had heard that Copeland confessed to slaying Donovan Thomas and had been threatened with two years of jail time for refusing to testify. When Steele refused to disclose his source, he was held in contempt of court in order to spend 10 weekends in jail. Despite this, Steele was allowed to stay in the courtroom with his client Jeffrey Williams, Young Tug. The Georgia Supreme Court issued a stay on the jail order pending Steele's appeal. Steele and other defense attorneys then filed motions seeking Judge Glanville's removal, which Glanville denied, complicating matters further. Diamond Yak Gotti Kendricks, another defendant on trial with Williams, attempted to bypass the lower court by filing a motion directly with the Georgia Supreme Court. Kendricks' motion included allegations that Deputy District Attorney Simone Hilton had told Copeland he wouldn't be prosecuted if he lied on the stand and that Judge Glanville had coerced Copeland into testifying. However, the Supreme Court referred the motion back to the lower court, stating that a lower court judge must review the motion for removal. Judge Glanville then announced the trial would be put on hold until the Kendricks motion and previous motions could be addressed. This announcement came on the day Glanville had planned a private review of the ex-party meeting with the lawyers. He also declared his intention to release the full transcript of the meeting, defending it as proper based on case law. This series of events highlights significant tension and controversy within the trial. The ex parte meeting and its fallout have raised serious questions about judicial conduct and witness handling. The defense's claim of coercion and improper prosecutorial promises are serious allegations that have undoubtedly impacted the trial's progression. The public release of the transcript aims to shed light on the events of the ex parte meeting. However, it remains to be seen how this will influence the motions for Judge Glanville's recusal of the overall direction of the trial. The involvement of the Georgia Supreme Court underscores the high stakes and legal complexity surrounding the case. So if you could state and spell your first and last name for the record, please. Kenneth Copeland. Ma'am. Do you want to be here? I'm here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Copeland, given the fact that you have invoked your Fifth Amendment privilege, but the state has already given you immunity, this court holds you in willful contempt, and uh, we'll see you on Monday. I'm taking him into custody. Trial paused indefinitely. The meeting began without state witness Kenneth Lil Woody Copeland. Initial discussions focused on Copeland's legal representation. Jonathan Melnick, Copeland's attorney, expressed a desire to be discharged if Copeland decided to testify, while Caleb Bumpus, another lawyer, felt unprepared to take over. There was also an exchange about an email Melnick had sent to lead prosecutor Adrian Love, accusing the state of putting Copeland's life at risk. Love denied this accusation. 
When Copeland eventually joined the meeting, he admitted to never being truthful in his life and expressed confusion about the situation. This prompted prosecutor Simone Hilton to address his concerns regarding potential criminal liability, reassuring him of his federal and state immunity. Hilton even told Copeland that if he confessed to a slaying on the stand without any independent evidence, he would be immune from prosecution for his testimony. This statement highlights the complexity and contentious nature of the legal maneuvering in this case. Copeland, seeking clarification, asked if there was a statute of limitations on slaying. Hilton responded that without independent evidence of his involvement, they couldn't charge him based solely on his statements. She emphasized that the state's goal was not to imprison him but to have him testify and thereby purge himself of the contempt charge. Despite these assurances, Copeland remained hesitant and continued to argue with the prosecutors. He questioned whether he had previously agreed to testify or had intended to plead the Fifth Amendment. Hilton reiterated that Copeland had been granted immunity and now had to decide whether to testify or remain in custody until the trial concluded. She made it clear that if he chose not to testify, he would remain detained until all defendants in the case, not just the six currently on trial, had been tried. The meeting's dynamics highlight the high stakes and intense pressure faced by witnesses in such high-profile cases. Copeland's reluctance and the prosecutor's insistence on his testimony underline the challenges in managing witness cooperation while ensuring their safety and legal rights. Judge Glanville's decision to pause the trial and release the transcript of the ex-party meeting indicates the gravity of the situation. The defense team, particularly Young Tug's attorney Brian Steele, raised concerns about the propriety of the meeting and its impact on the trial's fairness. Steele's contention that Copeland confessed to a slaying and was threatened with jail time for refusing to testify added further complexity to the proceedings. The trial's indefinite pause allows for a thorough review of the motions seeking Judge Glanville's disqualification or recusal. This review is critical to ensure the integrity of the trial and address any potential biases or procedural missteps. And, and look, if she, if she wins the motion, ultimately she wins. But you don't do it by standing there three feet from you in your face and lying to the court. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm just not. We are starting right now. It's 1.20. So, both of you all have equally responsibility to do that. I'm not punishing anybody, but you know, pr but prior preparation prevents poor performance. I'm not going to have any more discussion about this, madam. I'm not. Judges meeting transcript released. Initially, Copeland questioned the number of remaining defendants, to which prosecutor Simone Hilton replied there were 12. Copeland then requested a private conversation with his attorney, Caleb Bumpus, which led to a temporary recess. Upon their return, Copeland expressed concerns about the consequences lying on the stand. Hilton clarified that discrepancies in his testimonies would be questioned but assured him that saying I don't recall was acceptable if he genuinely couldn't remember past statements. Despite Hilton's reassurances, Copeland remained apprehensive about being locked up again, arguing with prosecutors about potential outcomes if he lied or refused to testify. Judge Glanville reiterated that Copeland had immunity and would only face jail time if he committed perjury or refused to testify. The judge and prosecutors explained perjury to ensure Copeland comprehended the gravity of giving false testimony. Hilton attempted to reassure Copeland further by emphasizing the benefits of testifying such as being with his family and witnessing significant personal events. This persuasion seemed to work after additional private discussion with Bumpus as Copeland eventually agreed to testify. Before entering the courtroom, there was a brief debate about Copeland's attire. Despite efforts to find him suitable clothes, Copeland chose to wear his jail clothes, insisting that the public see his situation as consequence of state actions. Insisting that the public see his situation as a consequence of state actions. Notably, the transcript does not directly mention Copeland admitting to slaying Donovan Thomas. 
contrary to claims made by Young Tug's attorney Brian Steele. Copeland did admit to committing unspecified crimes during the meeting but did not provide detailed confessions on the record. During Steele's opening statement in November, he claimed that Copeland had asked Young Tug, whose real name is Jeffrey Williams, to rent the car used in Thomas's laying. Copeland's allegedly told Williams he needed the car to protect his family and Williams, known for helping friends, complied. However, Copeland has never been indicted for Thomas's slaying. Instead, Shannon Stilwell and Diamond Kendrick, among others, face charges related to the crime. The motions for Judge Glanville's recusal or disqualification are still pending, with no set date for a hearing. The trial, marred by numerous disruptions, began on November 27, 2023, following an unprecedentedly lengthy jury selection process. The defense has expressed concerns that the trial could last years due to extensive list of state witnesses. Some defendants have yet to go to jail and plea deals were recently offered to several remaining defendants. Five have rejected these deals, while three have not decided yet due to their lawyer's unavailability or recent involvement in the case. This case has drawn significant attention since Williams and 27 other suspected gang members were arrested on May 9, 2022, following a 56-count indictment. Prosecutors aim to prove that YSL or Young's Lime Live is a criminal street gang responsible for various offenses with Williams as its leader. The unfolding legal proceedings, complex testimonies, and high-profile nature of the trial continue to captivate public and media attention. As the case progresses, the implications for those involved and the broader legal landscape will be closely monitored. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.